Hi, I'm Derek Leahy. I'm the host of the Rural Roots to Climate Solutions podcast. We're really happy and super proud to be working with the Alberta Communities and Cooperatives Association in running the ComGen Network. Now, the ComGen Network is made up of municipalities, community groups, individuals, installers, people who are interested in producing renewable energy for the communities, but producing renewable energy in a way that it has community benefits. Help, what the heck are these community benefits? The presentation you're about to watch, this was uh, done by Jennifer Ford, who's a member of the Peace Energy Cooperative. This is part of our ComGen Network lunch series. Her presentation does a lot better job than I can do explaining what exactly community benefits are. And it's also just a great starting point for anybody who's interested in producing renewable energy for their community. So uh, I'm Jen Ford. I'm um, the Peace River representative for the Peace Energy Cooperative here. Um, the Peace Energy Cooperative started as many grassroots organizations do around kitchen tables with like-minded friends, the common goal. Uh, in 2003, Peace Energy, a renewables energy cooperative, was officially born, although they had many years prior incubating towards their goal. For Don Pettit, our ED, and Greg and Joanne Duick, some of uh, the original Dawson members, with their friends around those tables, um, their goal, their common goal, was a wind farm. And at that time, wind was more accessible than solar. With the combined efforts of them and a few other organizations, they were able to create the Bear Mountain Wind Project. And fast forwarding to today, the Bear Mountain Wind Farm now provides power to over 37,000 homes in the Dawson Creek area. And a portion of that revenue still goes to, to PEC and its investing members, which is pretty cool. If you wanna know more about this Bear Mountain Wind Project, I can uh, get some more information on it later on. I think uh, we can largely credit community engagement to our success with Bear Mountain. They, um, by ensuring that everyone knew what was happening, what our plans were, how things were moving forward, and most importantly, that anyone who needed to felt like they were heard and listened to. I think that made a big difference um, with, the, with that project, as well as with our success with ASAP so far. We started our community engagement way back at the beginning, and we're doing our best to keep it moving during the COVID crisis. I think I would argue that a good community engagement plan can be one of your most important areas of focus on, on any project, really. Um, so where are we with ASEP now? I, we recently got news, I think as many others who were applying for the grant, that we were not successful in our grant application uh, with the MCGC grant, but we're not pulling the brakes just yet. We will continue to work forward towards making ASEP happen uh, with the with not having the grant, we'll have to downsize a bit, maybe trim our CBA, which, which hurts the feelers a bit. We all have our pet projects in the CBA. Uh, we'll look towards other areas that we can rework, but at this point, we're still moving towards uh, our common goal, which is creating multiple community-owned renewable projects here in Alberta. And just a little bit about ASEP, if you're not familiar with it, that's our, um, our Peace River Airport uh, Community Energy Project. It would be on 5.3 hectares of leased land and uh, with grid tied solar electricity, 2.9 megawatts of DC. And our total cost for that project, uh, what, what we were looking at in the beginning was 5.65 million. And again, now without the grant, we may have to look at tweaking that a bit, but um, that's, that's news for later, I suppose. Okay, oops. So uh, how, did, how did Peace Energy Cooperative end up in Northern Alberta and Peace River? Um, I'll get to that here. Quickly, I'll just point out the people in this slide here. So left to right, Greg Duick, he's kind of my counterpart, the guy training me and helping turn me into a solar guru. Uh, he's our designer in, in Dawson Creek. And then that, he was one of our original people around the kitchen table along with Don Pettit next to him. He's our executive director. Uh, also an amazing photographer and writer. And then Wanda Lauren, she's the one kind of stirring the pot. Um, here she has been for years on renewables and environmental awareness here in the Peace region. And then on the other side, there's Ron Mock. Um, again, he's one of the people who was around those kitchen tables in the beginning of the creation of PEC. He's our in-house electrician. So he does our electrical design and also our, a lot of our installs. And then that's me 
And then there's Ed Neggs from HVP or H oh HES, sorry, in um in Victoria. So I talked a bit about this uh, last time we were online together, but I'll recap quickly as I think it's a huge reason that we've gotten as far as we have with ASAP. Um, so a group of Peace River locals teamed with Peck and the town of Peace River on the MCGC grant to get ASAP off the ground. Wanda Lauren had started the groundwork, like I said before, with the preliminary conversations and uh, just getting that, the idea of renewables happening in the piece. And then the uh, getting the EOI with uh, the expression of interest with the Peace Energy Cooperative and Town of Peace River. That was all happening just before I came on board. And um, then at first, our group was calling ourselves the Peace Solar Cooperative kind of tentatively as we worked towards creating our own cooperative entity. Our plan at the time was to create a separate cooperative to work with the Town of Peace River and PAC to create ASAP. And then once we started working with PEC a little more and the months went on, we thought, hey, you know, we're a really good team with these guys. After ASAP, we should do some more stuff with them. And um, we were all really excited about that. And then moving forward a little more, uh, long story short, it became really apparent that creating a separate cooperative to work alongside another one doing the same things was a bit redundant. So why were we recreating a very expensive and time consuming wheel to carry out the same goals to fruition? So we sat down with Greg and Don at the incubator that we went to, uh, I think it was uh, last September, and weighed out some of the pros and cons of Peace, the Peace Solar Group merging with PEC. Uh, the cons are pretty slim and based mostly off of our insecurities of co-parenting this new baby with people that we were just kind of getting to know. Um, but, uh, oops, did I miss one there? Um, the pros, the pros kept adding up and it just became apparent that uh, it was in everyone's best interest um, to, to join together as one cooperative. So then we became the Alberta Continuance of, of Peace Energy Cooperative. And so those common goals that we have are bringing community-owned renewables to the north, reducing our GHG globally, uh, providing profitable local investment platforms in renewables, and raise feasibility awareness of renewables in the north. Um, I think for me that's one of the ones I'm most passionate about. So moving forward, we kept working on ASAP together. Uh, the work that we did for the grant was not all for naught as we would have had to do most of it anyway moving forward, SANS grants. So, and one of the most challenging parts, I think, um, during that whole process was trying to figure out all the approvals that we needed, like the ACL prelims and the federal transportation review and the wildlife surveys. What order did they need to be done in? Some of them expire uh, in certain amounts of time. So when's the best time to start them so that they finish so you get the most out of them, that kind of stuff. I think we can safely say that we made a really good move investing in our wildlife surveys right away. It takes a full year to complete those. And although it was a bit of an upfront investment, I think we'll be better for it in the end as we'll be able to move forward more quickly um, if everything pans out the way we're hoping for. So some other challenges that, uh, that we faced along the way, understanding the Alberta grid and rate schedules for microgen. Now, I'm not sure I mentioned this before, but um, as, as Peace Energy Cooperative, we also do residential and um, uh, commercial installs. So it, it works, the billing structure works a lot differently in Alberta than it does in BC. We have kind of this wild west sort of opportunity here in Alberta, but that also makes things more challenging with understanding and translating billing rate schedules. So if you're trying to tell a customer what they're going to save, every time we think we have this distribution and transmission thing figured out, we don't. Um, we think we're getting closer, but um, every, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not holding my breath on what we haven't figured out yet. We're working with somebody at ICO who's been really helpful, but if anyone else has any sort of way to calculate the financial solar benefits um, in your back pocket, uh, we'd be much appreciated if you'd be willing to share that. Uh, the Alberta Power Pool and the PPAs for uh, community solar has been another one that's been a bit challenging to figure out. And then discussing with people, when is the best time for solar? Um, what does it cost? What will I save? How does it work? And then the snow effect and how many batteries do I need? Will I need batteries? Is the grid really worth being tied on to all of those conversations that I'm sure most of you listening to us, listening to this have 
have went through as well. Um, they can feel a little redundant sometimes answering the same questions, especially the feasibility in the North ones. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> Just believe and be with us. Um, so that, that one's been a bit challenging. So our original group, uh, like yours, has been working our butts off to get the big ball rolling and becoming a cooperative, uh, getting our project going. Now I feel like we're pretty lucky to be paired with Peck as it saved us a ton of time, money, and effort. And now I think we're a bigger, badder, better team for it. And we'll likely get to see a project to fruition a heck of a lot faster than either of us as our own entity. Um, having a potential project in the near future will give our members the opportunity to invest in a locally owned renewable project, plus provide benefits to our global health and contribute, contribute our global health and contribute to community benefits in the long run. So opportunities, um, that's one that we're always stirring around for. I think uh, most of you are as well, like cooperatively. Um, a big challenge has been finding good investment opportunities for our membership after Bear Mountain. And our, our members are us and our friends and our families and our community members. And we wanna make sure that we're taking care of them and finding good opportunities for them. So finding friendly regulatory areas that we can build something in. BC has had very little opportunity since Bear Mountain. And ultimately we need projects for us and our members to invest in. We need communities like ours here in Peace River to be on board to help us host those projects and our common goal. So it's not just collecting a layer of dust. So um, we've opened our Peace River office as we joined with, with Peace Energy in January. It was a very exciting time for me. I had a real desk to work at. <laughs> um, personally, um, yeah, it was ex an exciting time for the co-op as well and our team until the COVID crisis, we had a good amount of street traffic at our local, we had a good amount of street traffic and our local membership was growing very well. It was awesome just sitting at my desk. I have a nice big east facing window and people would just walk by and see some of the pictures of solar that we had in the windows and they'd just come in and talk. It was, it was great. Um, I'm looking forward to that again once I get back to working at the office after COVID settles down. And I feel like I can credit a lot of the traffic and the interest that we have in our community to Juan DeLoren and the others like her who've been stirring the pot here in our region for years now. The community was and is very ready for this thanks to a lot of the work that they did um, in, these, in the previous years. We've had over 40 new members since opening our office and getting rolling here and the interest is still very heavy, even during this strange time. I think the uncertainties now kind of make renewables a little bit more appealing in a way to some. An important point again that I think I should bring up here, if we hadn't joined with PEC, um, we would essentially be competing for the same membership base to invest in the same project pool. And that just didn't make a lot of sense to us. We all had the same common goal to get renewables up here. Um, and yeah, just recreating the wheel didn't make sense, especially when we wanted to work together on so many things. So we're looking at this at a lens of how we wanted to invest in renewable, renewables ourselves and how we wanted to see our friends and family and community members benefit from the investment opportunity. So and that brings us to our community benefits plan. This was a really fun and challenging part to put together. Um, our CBA is obviously a lot bigger than this, but um, we all had things we were pretty passionate about and there was a lot of overlap and not everything made it in. And now without the grant, we we're hoping to still do as much as we can. But uh, one that we're all very passionate about is mixing agriculture in with our solar farm. So getting sheep out there, bees, um, there's been some good research on growing vegetables under solar panels too. So we'll, that's one that we're all pretty excited about that we're teaming with young agrarians and we're hoping to continue to do. Bursaries for electrical tradespeople who want to focus in renewables was one we were pretty passionate about and scholarships for grade 12 grads going into electric and, and to focus on renewables as well. Um, another one that we were pretty excited about that we, we think is really important is an area of the project to be dedicated just to PV research here in the north. So what is the best technology or technology combination that works for our northern climate and gets us the most power? especially in the winter months, right? Um, we also wanted to, we're hoping to do an array for a nonprofit community or, or organization at a discounted or fully compensated rate. So um, hopefully we can still find some funds or grant money to, to help with that. 
and a knowledge transfer package. This is one we are very excited about as well with like a blog and a vlog, some photo journalism, a hard copy book, and then maybe get a professional videographer working on that. Uh, just to, to show people the process that we are going through and the learning that, uh, that we have along the way. How can we, that we thought this was the best way to share our learning as we go um, and show other communities the, how it's possible to get their, their, their own project going and with or without our help. So, um, so we came up with these again by brainstorming together what we were passionate about and pulling out the ones that made the most sense with the project. So just uh, to finalize this, uh, some tips that I would give and someone I was sitting down with going forward. Uh, top tip would be to be flexible. Um, as a doula, this is one, this is a this is a life tip, not just a project tip. Um, this is kind of like a birth plan thing that I would discuss with my clients when I was a doula. Your plan is never going to go as planned. So this project, this baby, um, it's keep keep the goal. The goal is the baby, the goal is the project, but the path to get there is going to change and, and that's okay. And uh, this is one I, I swiped from the incubator. Try not to be married to your location. Um, this is a great bit of advice. If you're hitting walls with where you're trying to build, take a few steps back and look around for a less difficult place. Again, keep your eye on the goal and be, be ready and willing for that path to change. Building relationships. This is a really important one. The team needs to have a good group together. So you need your, your internal relationships to be sound and you need to be working well together. But you also really need those relationships and rapport with your community and your stakeholders. So participate in things happening around the community. I mean, like Wanda and I always try to have one of us going out to something that's going on. It doesn't always happen, but if we see something that we think aligns even a little bit with what we're doing, we call each other up and say, hey, can you go to this or can you go to that? Obviously not now with COVID, but that's, uh, that has been, that was our kind of um, attack plan before. Uh, and then an elevator speech. So identify as a team, as you're going out and talking to people, what are the key points that you want to drive home when you're, when you're chatting with people about your project or about um, your organization? And I think this is important in, in any project or any organization, having, having an aligned message. So, and it might be different for each, each team member. Um, before COVID, Wanda and I were really getting a lot of traction just being our chatty selves out in the community and having a few sort of canned points to talk about while we were out and about. And uh, just getting those speaking points together, be sure that your group has, um, has all of this, like the same pool of points to pull from, keeping consistency in your message. There's actually a lot of really good YouTube resources on this elevator speech thing, and I have some of them together somewhere. Um, I'll get them together to, to share with you guys afterwards. Uh, drawing out your timeline. Again, this kind of goes back to the path and the goal. What needs to happen and when, and what can be done and when. And uh, this is the kind of planning that made it pretty clear to us that it wasn't in everyone's best interest to create two, to have two different entities working towards the same goal. Uh, what brought us together is one entity. So also your planning will identify time sensitive and budgeting items that you may need to address sooner than others. So that again, this brought us back to our, our wildlife survey. That was one of the most important things that we thought needed to be started sooner than later um, with whatever road we went down. So I think that's, that's everything I, I have for you guys today. I will get those links and notes on the elevator speech to share with everyone. I, I think that's a really important one for for any group to have down. Um, is there any questions? Sorry, I was on mute there, Jen. Uh, that was awesome. I, I, sorry, you. I think, uh, Seth, did you have a question? You can go first. No, just thank you. That was, that was amazing. Like well, uh, the prep and the, uh, yeah, so many great takeaways and to hear like, yeah, that it's that it's really happening and and dealing with the COVID stuff, but that you have these like just such a strong foundation and a clear clear direction that it's going to happen. So yeah, that was that was great, great presentation. I stumbled a little bit in the middle there. <laughs> yeah, crushed um, it, yeah. No, you crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah I was worried about my sound. I kept trying to point my face onto my mic. Um, great. Yeah. No, it's been it's been a really awesome adventure. I, I've enjoyed every minute of it really cool 
Did I have uh, two questions? So my first one was about the wildlife survey. Like, I think that was really smart jumping on that before uh, you were, like, I, I found like a lot of communities in Alberta were held up by that MCCAC challenge grant. Like they didn't, they don't want to do anything until they get the grant. But then yeah. once they get the grant, they got like a two to three year process and anything can happen during that time. Just wondering for your, your guys case, because obviously doing wildlife surveys, there's, there's costs to go with that. Yeah. How were you able to justify the cost of doing that in like, but not knowing that you're actually gonna get the money for the grant? Well, we, we had, um, that was a struggle really. Um, so we had to have a sit down and, and discuss, okay, worst case scenario, um, we spend all this money and nothing happens. <laughs> Best case scenario, we get our whole grant and we have an awesome ROI. So we just kind of had to draw out sort of plan A, plan B, plan C, and even a little bit of a plan D and what that might look like and then evaluate, um, I guess even on the, on the the plan D level like if worst case scenario would this still be worth doing and we felt like it was um, we felt like we would want to move forward with the project regardless of whether or not we got the grant we'd want to continue trying to make it happen we have a great uh, pool of members uh, uh, that who are hungry to invest in a renewables project and we feel like there's a lot more out there so we felt like even if we didn't get the grant we would still want to move forward um, the best we can to make this happen so doing the wildlife survey just made sense does that okay. answer for you? Totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my, I, I can hold off my second question if somebody, I, I think poor uh, DC there hasn't had a chance to speak yet. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask about the environmental um, process. H how long did that take you guys for your project? Uh, and ha have you completed it already? It's just started. So we're working with Rob Stabney here in Peace River. Um, uh, we're lucky in a small town. <laughs> I, I knew the three options available for us for a wildlife uh, survey person or contractor, consultant, I guess, sorry. Um, and uh, I approached all of them and Rob was, um, Rob was who, we, who we chose to work with. One of them wasn't available and the other two, they worked together with Rob. So it was decided that Rob was the best person to do it. And, and then away he went, he started on it. And he's been really good working with us and really flexible. Um, we're pretty lucky that, that he understands the dynamics and the challenges of our project. So he's just kind of did a bit of a desktop to start with and then did just a really light walk around. He was already familiar with the area, which helped. It wasn't far out of town, so there wasn't a lot of travel with, with him, so that helped. Um, but he's he started in the fall, so you'll have to keep going probably until August or September, like until migration stops. I think is is where we'll we'll get our final report. Does that answer right. your question, or did I? Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So my other question uh, was, and I can't remember if uh, this came up in the presentation. I was too I was too busy trying to keep up with the slides, uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember. I think you or Wanda brought it up one time that the the community benefits you guys were proposing to go along with your project that was actually something that really attracted I, one investor in particular I think it was something about like some of the revenue from the solar array was to go to a school or a school food program and that particular investor believed had already invested in school food programs so like oh perfect this, this fits into our CSR program I'm just wondering how you guys managed to connect those dots and maybe is this like a recommendation you put out there to other communities in rural Alberta saying like, it, listen, this actually having good community benefits in place or at least having your head around that is actually oh, a way wow. to attract invest, investment for your project. It really surprised me when I heard it. Absolutely. I think um, uh, there has to be a reason for, for everyone to buy in. I mean, yeah, it's a renewables project. That's great. I can invest in it and make a bit of an ROI. That's great. But what makes, what makes our project a, a little better and a little different while well, we're local and while well, we're supporting a local initiative. So um, I think one that we were hoping to support, and again, nothing's written in stone because this is all still preliminary, but um, it, Alberta food matters. So getting, um, getting hot lunches into the schools so that's something that we were that was on our cba that we hope we will still be able to support and those kind of things they they make it more appealing 
to certain investors like okay i'm passionate about food in schools i'm passionate i'm passionate about local agriculture um and, it, and then this project supports all of those things so i can support that support some things that i'm I'm passionate about in my community and also make a, an ROI off that. So, um, yeah, I think a community benefits plan, um, you don't want to be too robust, but you do, you want to have a few things in there to, to attract different people with different um, things that, that, that mean something to them, that, that make them want to do it more for than just being a little greener and investing a little greener. Does that make sense? So did I answer that? Totally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. In terms of the membership of the co-op, how how is the membership um, uh, growing? It's been great. Like COVID has slowed it down a bit, but I, I get an email every now and then, and and trying to keep our marketing going a little bit and touch base with people who. I know who have wanted to get memberships, but we just haven't connected. So it's still rolling, not as well as it was while I was in the office, but um, it's still definitely rolling. We need members to be in good standing for when we, when or if I should say, we do our um, our share offering for whatever project we, we start with. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I try to make people understand. Don't wait until we're doing a project because then it's going to be too late. You want to get your membership in before, and and not just not just for your opportunity, but hey, I mean, I think we're supporting. We're working hard to make this happen for our community, for for our friends and families, and to to make like help bring our GHG down globally. So um, yeah, that that membership helps us keep our doors open and helps us keep operating, and helps us keep finding solutions for for our members and our, for our communities. That's, that's great to hear. So do you like, just sorry, another co-op question. So is the board, the, are they the co-op based in, in BC or is it a mix with uh, the folks in Alberta or, or how does the, the structure look with the continuance? Um, it's, it's a little bit mixed. Um, there are some BC people stepping down and some more Alberta people putting their names up for votes. So we're hoping to have a better mix moving forward. Our AGM was actually supposed to be at the beginning of May, but with COVID we've had to shove it back a bit. Yep. So um, I think we're, we're looking at September now. Um, and then, yeah, with that, so we have some, some Alberta members who are hoping to get onto the board and hopefully that all works out well. I think it will. Um, I mean, ideally we want more of a mix. We have a bit of a mix now. Um, and the people who've been working on the board, as you know, with boards, is they've been on there forever because there's no one else to step up. <laughs> um, so, and and, and they're the people that, that helped create this baby. So they're not going to step down unless someone else is ready to take the torch, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we, we feel the same way about our ComGen network. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I have too much on my plate, and it'd be really nice if somebody would take this. But uh, nobody did. something that we are doing a, with the ATM. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because yep. uh, most, of, most of the original membership is concentrated in northern BC. But then there's some in southern BC, and there's like, obviously we have a lot in Peace River. So what, what we had done, and what we've had to cancel it, but what I'd like to set up a, when we in September when we get moving again with the AGM is a proxy location so I had rented a room at the local college here and so that we could all meet in the Peace River area here rather than all of us driving to Dawson to try to do this AGM so um. I don't know what it is about peace country but they have so many awesome people up there on, on both sides of the provincial boundary so in alberta and bc i mean by that i uh, thank you so much to jennifer and the peace energy cooperative for that presentation like i said for folks starting out with community-owned renewable energy this is just such a great starting point so thank you so much for sharing your story the ComGen Network Lunch takes place every other Friday from noon to 1 p.m. We do use Zoom, which is an online platform. If you have a weak internet connection, don't worry too much about it because you can phone in. And like I said, the lunch is open to anybody in Alberta who's interested in community-owned renewable energy. 
You do need to register for the lunch in advance though. So go to the website, which is acca.coop slash comgen. So C-O-M-G-E-N. Thanks so much for watching this video and hope to catch you at the next Comgen Network Lunch.